So the topic that I've been given is a variety of different topics that I've been given to to try and talk to today. Is this question of God, rules, hypocrisy, and what is at the heart of real Christian faith? My experience coming to Christian faith as an adult has been different um, than I thought it would be. I thought that it was going to be like boring old, dry, arid monotheism. I thought that I was going to have to, if I was to be a religious believer, I was going to have to sing songs to something that never talked back and that would never have any possibility of any back and forward or any real living relationship. How wrong I was, how utterly wrong I was about that. And I'll explain a bit more of my story as I go. I want to tell you first of all about something that I did. When I was um, 14 or so, 14, 15, I was at boarding school uh, near Bath and I managed to get a key cut to the master's dining room, the common room, and to this craft design technology workshop. So I jumped in a taxi and got, got to Tipsons and got the master's key cut and got back to school with it. It led to all kinds of wonderful pranks and fun, but one particular evening, I um, went with a couple of friends, Daniel and Jeremy, into the CDT workshops and we um, turned on all the lights um, and we started to mess around with all the equipment in there. I had a lathe spinning around, I had a robotic arm over a mezzanine floor dropping chisels into a workbench with a target on it below, it was sort of sticking into it, it was great fun. The CDT teacher obviously had been telephoned at home, he came in um, to try to sort of figure out what was going on, why were all these machines on. He came into the CDT um, sort of foyer area and we heard him. So we quickly darted for hiding places. Jeremy tried to hide in one of those cupboards that has all the tools on the insides of the doors. And there really isn't an inch of space in those sorts. It's the worst possible hiding place, just for you to know. Making all sorts of funny noises in there, he's just trying to hide. Daniel and I tried to jump out of a window. It was a, one of those windows that sort of goes on a hinge in the middle like that. And, and we dove through, and one of each of our feet got caught, snagged, on a cord that you use to pull the window closed. And so we were left hanging outside of the window, looking back in at the CBT teacher as he came into the room and turned the lights on. He sort of looked at us very oddly, hanging on the outside of the window. All we could think of doing was putting our pullovers, our jumpers over our heads to try and disguise our identities. <laughs> so I've never personally been very good at um, keeping to the rules. The cord broke as it happened and um, we fell into the hedge. Jeremy was discovered, he gave us away and we got in all sorts of trouble for that. Um, sometimes doing the punishments together were as much fun as doing the pranks together, so I'm not sure whether it really worked. I, I always perceived Christian faith to be archaic, repressive, a sort of locked down way of viewing the world that stifled real healthy human flourishing and functioning and relationality. And there is this perception that Christians are a bit deluded and willing to live under restrictive rules, rules that repress them and stop them living life to the full. One particular story of a reverend talking to somebody after a service. I hope you didn't take it personally, reverend, said the embarrassed lady after a church service, when my husband walked out during the sermon. Oh, I did find it rather disconcerting, the preacher replied. It's not a reflection of you, sir, insisted the lady. He's been walking in his sleep ever since he was a child. <laughs> what do we want when we say to religion it's repressive, it's got these rules, it, it doesn't really get to what we're looking for? I think we're, sometimes what we're thinking is that if we throw away rules, if we throw away these restrictions, these boundaries, will find freedom. That's sometimes the impulse that lies underneath. That freedom is found in rejecting rules, rejecting boundaries, sort of not having rules. And that's very much a route that I walked for a long time. I got quite into, um, it's hard to describe it, but it's a sort of, it was a form of Eastern spirituality combined with a lot of quite strong marijuana use. And, and, I, and I would much of my spiritual beliefs were entwined and linked into the culture that I lived in and what we did to get high together. Um, and, and I, at that point, tended to think that the enemy of freedom was religion and that it was unnatural and it didn't really fit us as human beings and that freedom um, would be found in rejecting it, 
pushing its way and breaking free of anything institutional. And there's definitely a perception now in culture that anything that has any connection to institutional faith or traditional faith in, in the way that you probably understand me to mean it, that it's in some way deauthenticating, that it doesn't connect with us as we really are and, and where our questions really are. I was doing surveys last week on the University of Cardiff campus and talked to a lot of people who felt that they really wanted spirituality, they were really interested in big answers, in, in, big, in the big questions of life and having answers to those questions and finding purpose and meaning. They definitely had a sense of something more than just physical processes in the universe, but they at the same time um, weren't comfortable with institutional religion and working that through with them often was very revealing to them in terms of their perception of what, what church was or what religion might look like. It might be that the enemy of freedom, the greatest enemy of freedom is actually freedom itself. The greatest enemy of freedom may actually be freedom itself. It may be that pure freedom without any boundaries, without any restrictions would actually destroy itself. And we've seen that. And Throwing out all boundaries, which pretty much every psychological study shows us leads to less freedom, not more, it doesn't actually bring freedom to us. Throwing out all boundaries doesn't actually lead us to the freedom that we imagined or we hoped it would lead us to. And I found that. Sometimes we come to a point where we say actually healthy boundaries are necessary for us to experience and live and know freedom in our lives, having right boundaries around us and nurture and protect freedom. I've been married for eight years now and have three kids. And I definitely see that boundaries are key to the full freedom of life that my kids have and that we have in our relationship as well. And that without any boundaries at all, that would not only be a, a, a lack of freedom, but it could actually be destructive and damaging to each of us. One study looked at play, a, in schools and at break times, the children were running and screaming around with, within a fenced area, but then they removed the fenced area from the children at playtime, and the children huddled together and played a lot less. Quite interesting, isn't it? So I think sometimes we can think that um, freedom or the authentic spirituality or the answer here to how we're to find wholeness in our lives and defragment our lives a bit can be found in or saying no rules, get away with your rules and your boundaries. But maybe we come to a point where we say actually some boundaries are a good idea. Another approach is the approach of the Pharisees, where, where they say, let's really depend on a system, let's depend on rules, let's find a technique, a system, a process, and then let's treat that a bit like we might treat a machine, where we turn the crank and we get out either protection from the world or life transformation, transformation of the soul. And Jesus ran into this group of people over and over again called the Pharisees. So the Pharisees, when they had the choice between engaging with the world, um, they were concerned that the world would make them unholy, would make them dirty, that it would compromise them. And, and I'm sure you don't see yourself as a Pharisee, but I think I definitely see Pharisaical tendencies in my own life where my way of dealing with things that threaten my soul, that threaten my character, that might destabilize me, my way of dealing with them, and sometimes this is appropriate, is to just say, away from that thing, away from that thing, away from that thing. Keep myself separate from um, people who are not like me, maybe. Or, or, or somehow keep myself at, at arm's length from um, things that are going on in the world, things that might concern me, or it might dirty me, it, it might involve me, it might cost me something. And Jesus confronts this group of people who try to keep the world at arm's length, who try to stay separate, who evolve a perception about themselves, that they are better, that they are holier, because they begin to put their trust in the system, because that's what happens with us as human beings. We begin to put our faith and our trust in whatever system we're using. And so they put their trust in the system. Jesus confronts them quite directly. In Mark 7, he, 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 we come across them. Mark's eyewitness testimony records, the Pharisees and some teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and some of his disciples were eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. 
And the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. And so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating the food, their food with unclean hands? And Jesus at this point does something extraordinary. I don't think that Jesus takes them head on and says everything you think is wrong. I actually think what Jesus does is he takes their requirement and he makes it even more demanding. And then he shows them how they're already falling short of it. If you have a Bible, um, or if you have um, the opportunity to look a bit later, then the key um, verse in Scripture that I'm going to hang around, that I'm going to hang my, my next few remarks around, is a verse from Matthew's Gospel. And it's Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. Sorry, verse um, 19, 19 and 20. Jesus is here beginning his Sermon on the Mount. Matthew's setting up. Jesus' declaration of what the kingdom of God is like. He's already talked about the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who um, are poor in spirit. Blessed, blessed are those who realize that they need God. And so he's already painting and showing Jesus to be painting a totally countercultural vision of what it is to relate to God. It's not about being all black. It's actually about realizing and admitting mm. that you're not. And so then Jesus says this, he says in Matthew 5, and the whole of, the, of, of those, these three chapters in Matthew hangs around and hinges on this verse. Anyone who breaks the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same, talking about the commandments and the practices of, of the Old Testament, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So he's affirming, keeping the law, keeping the teachings. But, he says then, for I tell you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. He takes then each of the commandments, the Ten Commandments, he reads through almost all of the Ten Commandments, and instead of just repeating them, he says these apply not only to the external world of what you do in terms of your behavior, but it also applies to your heart. And he begins to point the commandments into that internal dimension, the inner dimension of the human self. I tell you, anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. You've heard it said a long time ago, don't murder. Anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who's angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him, the other also. You've heard it said, love your enemy. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. What is Jesus doing here? By engaging with the Pharisees, by engaging with these people, putting their trust in a system of rules? He's asking a question, I think. And the question is this. What is it to be a good person? What is it to be a good person? What does that look like? By pointing things inside, he's saying that it's not good enough if you, if you think of a good person as somebody who just does the right things, but inside you're, you're not there at all. You're not, the body's doing the motions, but your heart isn't actually in any way loving that person you're doing the, the thing for. You've got to actually feel it. You've got to be there. You've got to, inside, be different. He's saying that unless you start to do the sorts of things that I'm describing out of who you are, rather than just because you're keeping your system, unless you get to a level of being a different kind of person, then actually you don't meet my standard of righteousness. You don't meet my standard of goodness. So he's put the standard of goodness, the standard of righteousness, really, really high. He's saying, unless what you do comes authentically out of a heart that is totally in line, a character and a soul that's in line with what you're doing, unless you really feel what you're doing as you're doing it, then actually that's less than just doing the behavior or doing the kind of thing, but actually deep down really grumbling or really hating that person that you're doing it for. And at the core of Jesus' challenge to them, at the core of it all, is, is, is a challenge to who they're relying on who they're depending on, whether they have just a system or whether they have something more than that. So we have one way of approaching this question. What is spirituality? How do we find an authentic answer? 
Um, what can we make ourselves good enough? One answer is we throw away the rules. We get rid of all the rules. We think that freedom promises us liberation, but actually we do need some boundaries for our freedom. And it may be that we should understand some of scripture in the light of that, in terms of protective boundaries to support and protect life. The second way of approaching it is the Pharisees' way of approaching it, where they say, well, let's have a system. We're going to put our confidence in these rules. We're going to put our confidence in behavior. And the modern day equivalents of this sort of pharisaical behavior might be something like, well, I've got gifts, and I've got talents, and I've got abilities, and I'm a good person. I'm going to live my life as well as I can. I'm going to live my life using my gifts, using my talents to the best of my ability. And I'm going to hold certain beliefs, certain epistemological kind of commitments. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to say the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to do all these sorts of good things. And that will shape me, won't it? That will, that will achieve it. That, that will, that's the system. And at the heart of it, Jesus is saying, a good person, actually somebody who is transformed deep down, but also a good person. Somebody who's, who, who's really in a relationship with him. And that's the point I want to really leave you to think about is this. They had no relationship with him. In, in the example um, of somebody who throws away freedom, who throws away any kind of hope of a religious answer because they see that freedom will come through throwing away all boundaries and rules. There's no relationship. I have no relationship there with God. I have no help. I was on my own figuring it out. Every Eastern strategy you look at will say to you, you enact this idea. You become enlightened. You manipulate James Redfield's principles or Paolo Coelho's understanding or Robert Burns' the, sort of the secret law of attraction. You do it. You manipulate it. You tweak it. You have to change the machinery and, and, and put the energy in. It's not through a relationship. And so for the Pharisees then, who said, um, we're going to put our trust in these rules, it's like a different strategy, sort of confidence in the rules, not throwing away the rules. Jesus also says, you can't keep the rules because I'm going to make the standard higher to show you that he's sort of pulling away the rug from under their feet. But he's also going to say that you don't have a relationship with me, and it's actually a relationship with me that is at the heart of everything. Do you know who the number one group of people on the hit list for Jesus are? It's the Pharisees. They're the ones he goes for over and over and over again. The religious elite who tie people up in restrictive rules and never give people the heart of what God is interested in and what Jesus is interested in. Jesus is interested in a living friendship with each of us. They're trusting in a system. Others of us are trusting in not having a system. But actually, when we're lost, when we're confused, when we don't know who we are, when we become broken and fragmented in this world, we do need somebody to show us the answer, perhaps. And that's what I found in Jesus Christ. I didn't just find a new way of thinking, a new way of believing something, a sort of a philosophical version of Christian belief that appealed to me personally. I found a person, and that person was Jesus. And he changed my life completely changed my life. I was in the first year of my degree doing philosophy and I became convinced intellectually that Christian faith was a real and viable option for a thinking person. After a little while, after arguing with my friends, um, I eventually realised that I wasn't living that out in my own life. And so I knelt down on the floor in my room and I just held up my hands and I said, God, I think you're there. But I think it's more than just believing you're there. I, I think you're holy and I want to know you. Will you help me? Will you clean me up? And from that moment, my life has totally been changed. You could, I could introduce you to friends who knew me before for a long time, and friends now who have known me. And my life has totally changed and different. I'm no longer I'm dealing drugs. I'm no longer into all the things that I was into. I don't think I was doing those things because I was unhappy, and Jesus sort of, in some way, um, filled an emotional need. But he connected with me in a relationship and led me to a healthier place in my life. My wife says he's still got a lot of work to do, and I think she's probably right. But I wonder whether you can do something more than just beliefs here. In the story of Les Miserables, one night while the house sleeps, Jean Valjean helps himself to the family silver and scarpers. The next morning, three policemen knock on the bishop's door, and a guilty Jean Valjean is taken up. They're, they're all for throwing him into jail. The bishop then speaks and says, Ah, oh, here you are, he explained, looking at Jean Valjean. I'm glad to see you. Well, but how is this? 
I gave you those candlesticks too, which are of silver like the rest, and for which you can certainly get 200 francs. But why did you not carry them away with your forks and your spoons? And the bishop gets the criminal off the hook, sets him up for life with the challenge of using the money to become an honest man. Do not forget, never forget, that you have promised to use this money in becoming an honest man. Jean Valjean, my brother, you are no longer, you no longer belong to evil but to good, and it's your soul that I buy from you. I withdraw it from black thoughts and the spirit of perdition, and I give it to God. At the heart of this relationship that Jesus offers to the Pharisees, to those of us who would throw away um, any idea of an answer from outside, Jesus offers his, him his own self on the cross, a sacrifice to make us right with God. But the core of Jesus' offer is him being willing to go for the cross on our behalf. You see, all of the stuff that we don't meet up to, this standard of righteousness, this um, way of doing the right thing, without um, this, this way he describes of, of our righteousness, our goodness, surpassing that of the scribes and the Pharisees, they were good people, but they didn't meet the standard that Jesus was, our, was after, was looking for. They didn't meet the standard of being in God's presence. And so Jesus then takes our brokenness. He takes our failure to meet the standard, our failure to measure up. And he takes that to the cross. And on the cross, he opens up a way for us to have that relationship with him. Okay. My last story is from uh, Luke's Gospel, where Jesus tells a story about two men in the temple. In Luke 18, you'll find it. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people here, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stands at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus finishes the parable with these words. I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus isn't interested in people who pretend that they don't really need Jesus. Jesus is interested in people who are willing to admit that Life makes more sense with him in it, and that they do have need of his rescue, that they do have need of his way through. So 12 years ago, well actually 14 years ago now, I made a decision to follow Jesus. You're welcome to ask me about that, but for now, I'm going to push you back into um, your tables to discuss, to um, pose questions, to ask about this. I'm very willing to come up and take some of your questions in a moment or two. But I just want to focus the discussions, if I may, around one question, and it's this. If we, if, we, if we assume and if we grant that the New Testament is reliable and that what Jesus says about God and what Jesus says about relating to God is, is, is right, what kind or type of a relationship is God interested in? And maybe the backdrop for this is just considering the different roles that you have in your life. Student, brother, sister, some of you might be parents, um, you're a son, you're a daughter. We all have different roles and you might be an employee, an employer. You all have different roles through your life and those roles often denote or describe different types of relationships, different modes of relationships. For you, what is the main way that you see God interest? What mode of relationship, what type of relationship do you understand God to be interested in with people, with you? I encourage you to chat about that question and I'll come back and try and answer some of your questions in a moment or two. Thank you. <coughs> Really um, honest question. Um, 
that so it's a probably it's found in Acts chapter two, um, where lots of people are hearing the gospel proclaimed, um, they're hearing this message of the cross, of Jesus dying, of God um, showing that He's answered questions in the person of Jesus, and Peter addresses the crowd um, and tells them confidently what he's seen, and then he says, um, in reply to their question, the people heard this, that all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. So there was a real, honest, authentic reaction from them. They were saying, okay, we want to know more. How do we react? They weren't just cold to it. I mean, which, is, which is a great reaction sometimes. I like to just reflect on the fact that if, if, if God is real, and if Jesus really is from God, then this is the most amazing thing that the ears of humanity have ever heard. And so I think their reaction is heartfelt and appropriately so. They say, what shall we do? Brothers, what shall we do? They cut to the heart. Peter replies, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children, all those who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. Um, and then they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of the bread, and to prayer, and um, they become immersed in the life of the early church. So, very simply, Peter says, repent and be baptized. What that means is become um, uh, willing to admit publicly that you've become and, and that you want to put your trust in Jesus. And put your trust in Jesus Christ, the person for the forgiveness of your sins. Not for the forgiveness of your bad feelings or the hurts in your life, but for your moral outrage and offence before a holy God. So that sounds a bit harsh, but um, it, it's only when we really see who we are that we can really begin to allow Jesus to deal with who we are. And we really have to admit that. I'm so intrigued by the film Inception. If you have seen it, um, then um, you might... In, in, enjoy this reflection on it, but in the film Inception, it's a heist movie, the central character is played by Don Cobb, who's Leonardo DiCaprio, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, um, and he, he's in this sort of nomadic state, wandering the globe, and he can't go home. He cannot go home, he's, he's barriered for visa reasons and for other reasons, and he only begins to be able to head home, he only begins to find wholeness and to find an answer when he admits what he's done um, to somebody else in, in the film. You have to watch it to see what I mean. But um, when we really admit where we are, then that invites God in. Sometimes people say, um, I don't feel God. I, don't, I, I, I prayed and I'm not sure where God is. Um, you promised me that I would have a feeling. And I, I'm not sure I've ever promised that. I'm not sure God ever promises that. We live in a very sensitive age where we think we have to have instantaneous feelings for everything. But, the, the, the measure to which you will experience knowing God is the measure to which you will admit that you need Him. The, the depth of the grace that we experience, the depth of His forgiveness, and the depth, the depth of the reconciliation that you will experience, that meeting with Him and knowing His presence in your life is exactly related to the depth to which you will admit that you need Him, the willingness you have to admit that. So I think it's a recognition of need, a recognition of who you're putting your trust in, then it's um, being willing to witness to that and joining a Bible-believing church where you are encouraged and people are around you teaching you how to pray. And as you walk out that Christian commitment and that Christian life, I think you'll find that you discover God's presence surrounding you, His forgiveness coming into your life, and you'll begin to discover what Christians talk about as the joy of your salvation. And it's a wonderful and deep thing, and it doesn't have to leave you. Um, would anyone like to ask a question? Any further questions? Yeah. Or any other questions? Before? If not all, if anyone texted it, um, how did you come to the belief that, um, how did you come to believe that belief in Jesus was intellectually competent? Um, I came through, for me, two or three different routes. Formal um, philosophical argumentation. So, I was looking at the moral argument in particular, and I was really interested in how moral obligations seem to necessitate some sort of, if I believed in real, objective, absolute, true for all moral values, 
that that seemed to suggest some sort of um, supra-human mind, and that that superhuman mind would have to be moral, and I was interested in how um, that might have been revealed through um, philosophical arguments in terms of was there a, was there a personhood in that space, and what would it what, what would you need to have um, personhood? I was interested in the relationship between love and moral goodness, and I began to sort of try to think through okay. If the Trinity was one possible explanatory framework, bit philosophical. If the Trinity was one possible explanatory framework for moral grounding, then that would give us both a God who, in His own being, would have love, would also have semantic meaning, and He would also have the possibility of true communication and goodness could flow from His nature. And so I felt that, among different options, that was quite an interesting answer, and that moving more towards Trinitarian kind of um, metaphysics, if you like, but. The faith in Jesus as such, I mean, there were other philosophical arguments as well that I was interested in tracing and engaging with. Um, but the real, um, the, one of the real arguments came through just thinking about this witness of the New Testament, thinking about the picture that the New Testament presented. I was really sceptical about whether the New Testament recorded accurate history. And so I wasn't willing to start with the idea that what I read in the pages of the New Testament was accurate. But what I was willing to look at was sceptical scholarship about the New Testament. And I was willing to admit that even if I accepted the most sceptical picture of the New Testament, then Jesus had to exist. He had to have, according to his followers, reported to have done miracles. He was reported to have commanded a spiritual following. The place of his crucifixion and death seems to have been fairly sure. His disciples seem to experience a radical transformation. He, um, they seem to claim that they had resurrection appearances and experiences of him. The Saul and the emergence of Paul as the early church evangelist, as well as um, James, these sorts of characters to me were intriguing because that was an argument that didn't depend for me on um, what Christians said about the Bible, but it depended on um, what I thought was fairly solid historical scholarship. And so it was more through, through through that lens in part, and then I became intrigued by the resurrection claim itself. And I read into, if you're interested in reading, a really interesting case for the resurrection. There's a book by a guy called William A. Craig called The Sun Rises, The Sun, S-O-N, Rises, and I found his work to be quite um, eye-opening, and I was reading books by him, by Alvin Plantinger, by J.P. Moreland and um, Richard Swinburne, and I found that all of their work began to point me gently in a number of different ways towards a, a gentle belief that Jesus might have been who he claimed to be. And so I got to the point where I said, okay, this is looking more likely. I remember going to parties with my pals and saying, um, look, I've got this spiritual hypothesis. I think that we may need rescue, hope. I see this in story forms, in literature and in movies. Um, I think that a lot of human art is crying out for rescue and is crying out for redemption and for forgiveness and for hope. Thinking of Adele's song, you know, Hello at the moment, the sort of desire for a reconciliation to say sorry, for things to be made right. There's this cry in the human heart, there's a sadness around us. And Tolkien talked about it as the mourning, um, the mourning of our souls. Um, and, and I began to feel that many of these convergent different lines pointed me towards belief. And so I rehearsed some of these arguments with my friends, and they would say to me things like, stop preaching at me, stop sort of telling me all this stuff, and you're getting too heavy, you're getting too serious. And I was like, we're stoners, that's what we're meant to do. Um, <laughs> and, and, and in the end, um, I, I began to find their suspicion and their rejection of the conversation to be as intriguing as some of the ideas themselves. And um, I began to find that actually there was a reaction that was predicted um, in the scripture as to when you started to talk about Jesus. There was a lot of pushback, and I began to see that too, and that intrigued me even more. I'm the son of a lawyer, so I always like a, a bit back and forward. So, <laughs> it was a philosophical route, um, through moral arguments, through some of the fine tuning arguments, um, and, and also through um, reflecting on the historical Jesus, not starting with the Bible as um, infallible or um, correct, but just trying to build up a historical picture and then coming back to say, okay, if the picture that the 
Bible, the New Testament presents of Jesus seems to be a reliable picture, then that's pointing me towards, at the very least, even if I'm going to say not Christian and say sceptical, at least I have to have a higher view of the accuracy of Scripture. And then that began to necessitate me personally feeling like I needed to deal with the question of who he was. Um, I couldn't run away from that having I got to that point. Um, and it's, I think, in some ways, looking to Stoicism's journey. Obviously, his is much more thorough, um, but his journey was similar from step to step to wondering and then moving from sort of agnosticism to a type of theism and then moving from theism to just reflecting on and examining has God revealed himself? Is there good evidence? Is there, can we ask questions about this? Does it support an investigation? Um, I would really encourage you. Um, I'm so passionate about people having the opportunity to explore their questions. Um, when, I, when I became a Christian, um, I, I set up a website for um, an organization called UCCF who connect together Christian unions. It's called Be Thinking. Um, Bethinking.org. There's all sorts of talks on the historical Jesus, there's scholarship on there, there's philosophical stuff on there, there's all sorts of articles and material on there that you'd really do well to explore and dig into. So if you're on a journey and that stuff's helpful to you, I recommend it to you. Great. Um, I think that's all we've got time for. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's nice to do come and chat. If you want to talk more, um, if there are questions you'd like to ask me more personally, then I'd love to try to feel the answers to those questions as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, also, yeah, that website's great. Do go on that. Um, if you're here today for the first time and you'd just like to meet up maybe personally over um, one to one with someone, um, then you'll notice on the feedback forms there's a box saying, I'm interested. If you uh, click that and leave a name, college, and email, someone from the Christian Union will be in touch. Um, this is just a chance, maybe over the last couple of days of term, to meet up um, over a cup of coffee and um, just bring all your questions, any objections, any questions that you have, um, to have a, a more personal conversation. So do um, leave your details if you'd like to do that and pop it in the box at the back. Um, also next to that, you'll notice a whole variety of books. These are written by Christians and are hopefully um, really helpful in helping you to think about the things that we've just touched upon this lunchtime. So if you're here today as a guest of the CE, um, they're completely free, so do browse and have a look, and if any of you take your fancy, grab it on the way out. Um, also, who loves carols? Um, if you're into carols and all things festive, festiveness, um, <laughs> and, um, then the Christian Union are holding two um, carol services next week on Monday and Wednesday at 10pm at Great Seminaries, which is opposite Senate House. This is, should be a really good time um, just to come together. Um, Sing lots of carols, and there'll be a uh, talk by the brilliant speaker Graham Daniels um, about the uh, message of Christmas. Um, so do come along and just invite everyone to do that because um, that should be great. Um, I think that's about all we've got time for. Um, if you have to rush off to lecture, please um, feel free to leave. But if not, do stay and um, chat on the tables, and there'll be some dessert coming around in a second. Um, great. Uh, have a good time.